we have here on the panel Paul Schrader, well-known director and screenwriter, director of Adam Resurrected. Next to him, Joram Kenyuk, the author of that book. And next to Joram, we have Ehud Bleiberg, who I'm told has worked for years and years and years to put this film on the screen. I'm on record as the critic for Screen International at the Toronto Film Festival. I like the film very much. And if you go to ScreenDaily.com, I urge you to read my review of it. So let's begin talking now. Paul, and the uh, first question will be from Paul Schrader. Very general, what's the challenge? And people have been doing this since the beginning of films. People have taken have wanted to put novels on the screen. What's the challenge of it? What's the hardest thing about it, Paul? Yeah, well, it's certainly a lot easier now that we have sound. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I, I've been involved in a number of adaptions, both for others and myself. Uh, and I've directed uh, scripts that others have adapted. So I, I wrote Last Temptation of Christ, of a very, very, a book almost as difficult, no, not almost, as difficult as that of Resurrected. Um, for that was for Scorsese, and uh, I did uh, Mosquito Coast uh, for Peter Weir, and uh, I did uh, Affliction, uh, you know, for myself, and. Uh, and I've directed uh, a couple of uh, uh, Ian McEwan's Comfort of Strangers, and, uh, and there's something else out there too that I'm not thinking of. But every book is a different challenge. And it's a problem with the sound. Maybe it should be much more clear. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yes. Hello, Cleveland. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, every book's a different challenge. And sometimes they're relatively easy. The narrative of the book just folds into a two hour uh, narrative. That was the case with the fiction. And sometimes they're extremely difficult. And sometimes you're out to capture the book itself. And sometimes you're not. Sometimes. You want to do something different than the book does. And sometimes, as in the case of uh, Last Temptation, there were maybe five or six different scripts inside that book. And you have to go inside the book, and dig out all the various ways it can go, and pick the one you want to do that means the most to you. Uh, with uh, Adam, I did not adapt it. Uh, and uh, uh, Ava has just uh, joined us for a Bit because he can speak more than anyone else to the, uh, the history of how this uh, was adapted. It was uh, written by Noah Stolman, who is an American who studied here and, went and graduated from Sam Spiegel. And uh, one of the fierce challenges of this particular book is that it does not lend itself to realistic translation. Uh, it's a book that is uh, it's not quite magic realism, but it's not quite realism either. And there's a lot of internal monologues in it. The chronology is completely scattered. The ending of the book occurs about two-thirds of the way through. Characters have doppelgangers who may or may not be real. There's a second Adam, in fact, called Herbert. And the character is Shester, played by Han Laszlo has a twin sister who may or may not be her at any given time. So uh, it was an extraordinary, complicated task. And uh, I am a huge fan of that, of Bjorn's book. And so I have to preface all my remarks by saying that we made a very, a very good adaptation of this film. But we cannot approach the greatness of the book. The greatness of the book is defined by its literary quality, by its words. And when a, when a book is really a literary masterpiece, rather than just a narrative masterpiece, you can never quite do it justice, because it is what it is. You, know, you, you are never really going to do Sound in the Fury, you know, or um, uh, Lolita. You, you can get pretty close, but you can't really nail a book whose very language is its greatness. Uh, I mean, the reason I think Philip Ross books have always have failed to make good films 
is because he writes about despicable characters who are redeemed by language. And when you translate them into film, you have despicable characters, but you don't have language. So I mean, it makes it hard to do. Uh, so I, I've kind of drifted on for a bit, but I'll give it back to you. Yeah, Yoram, given, given what Paul said about the difficulty of adapting any novel, and particularly the difficulty of adapting this novel, were you skeptical or wary of anyone trying to make a film out of this book? And Paul is not the first person to do that, to try to do that. Well, first of all, is, you know, usually when I come to talk and in Israel the, the system doesn't work, and then I say a state that can put a missile in space still didn't solve the, this, uh, but now it works, so I'm very proud of the, the improvement in Israel. Anyway, uh, uh, I, I don't know, I mean, look, the idea for this mo movie and the book was first an idea for a movie. I thought of a movie, and uh, I gave it to Louis Meister, who was a uh, very famous director in Hollywood, in the, in the old white in the Western Front. And uh, so, I, in, in a way, the book was written while, you know, I, I started to write it when I was still a painter, so I saw it all the time. I saw it in my own eyes, how everything that in this book, it took me 10 years to write it, and, but I saw it. So in a way, I thought that it lent itself to be adapted. But of course, if they adapt the book, it would be a 16, 16 hours movie, and that's not very, really um, popular these days. And uh, I saw in Germany, East Germany, before the, the change, I saw someone made a play of Hamlet eight hours. And, I, and it was full. Two months later, when the wall fell, I came and only two people were sitting there. So, in <laughs> fact, uh, maybe they were forced to come and. But, uh, or they had something better to do. And in a way, uh, I think that what Noah did, and, 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 and what Ero did. But of course the director, Jeff, Jeff, uh, Jeff, Jeff I'm so tired, I'm so, I mean, so sick. Uh, uh, Paul had captured the essence of this book. It's a very difficult thing to be done. I didn't read the script. I didn't want to read the script. I only saw few of the shooting, a few days of the shooting, and as I said before, I only heard Paul saying cut, 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 and I said the whole movie will be about cut, <laughs> because uh, they say two words, cut. So I said, well, where is the, you know, when are people are going to talk, you know? <laughs> but uh, finally I, I saw it and I was very scared, and, and Eric was very sweet to me, and he, he hired this uh, theater in Tel Aviv, and he and I are the only people who sit there. And I was overwhelmed by excitement. And because, in a way, it is exactly the essence of the book. Uh, I, I, I can't tell you because I don't remember my books very well. And uh, sometimes I ask Edward, who is this and who is that? I, can go. I mean, when they did auditions for Paul, some girls called me and said, Who is Richard? Who is Richard? So I, I read it for the first time after 25 years. In order to say who is Rutschen, because I didn't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but, uh, but I think that Paul and Noah and uh, all the people who were involved, and of course Jeff, Jeff, the Jeff is not the, the atom that I thought, but I thought of more of a German Jew. But the idea that a man who has a genius, and the only thing he can do with genius is be a clown. It's something that I've seen in my life, not once and many times. Because you, you can, what can you do? I mean, the, and so uh, Jeff gave it this weight and Paul put it together in a way that I felt it was, it was really the book. I mean, before that, it was twice a play. Twice it was done as a play. One time it was called the Poet Party of Adam and Kelly, of Adam. And uh, then it was Gesso production, which ran 15 years. Uh, but it, 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 it was done like a, a theater play. 
uh, in circus. And, and it was not the book, it was the characters, but it was not the book at all. But yet it, it, it was some of the book. But here in the movie, the book is much more there than in the plays. Uh, I felt very, very, uh, I mean, when, when Jeff is talking and saying about his childhood, about it, uh, it, it, it's so much me that is talking to me, you know. And, and uh, so in a way, I think that Paul adapted me too, not only the book, he adapted me in a way. I mean, we never really had many conversations, Paul and I, because, I don't know, you always stay in another hotel. And, and, but uh, I feel very, very close to him, because he somehow, uh, like Elwood, Elwood has been my, my spiritual brothers for years. And, and, and so whenever I have a spiritual uh, relationship, it makes me very, very happy. And I think this is why the movie is so good. Not because of me, but because somewhere, someone captured an idea I had, because the book is an idea for a movie. Anyway, I can talk for hours, I don't want to. <laughs> Paul, did you, did you require the cast members to read the book? Or would that have, would, does reading the book give them too much information when you're dealing with a, a brief shooting schedule and, and a script that, that, that's, a, that's a distillation of the book? I wouldn't require someone to read the, the book, uh, mainly because you're just opening up uh, a can of very, very large worms. And uh, because you've made certain decisions, and you tell them to read the book, uh, and they will start to question the decisions you've made, you start going backwards. But, um, and so sometimes the actors will actually ask you, do you mind if I read the book? You know, and of course I don't. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and sometimes actors read the book and uh, are upset because their role has been diminished from the page to the screen. We want that scene back in, you know, that was, was cut out in, in, the, in the translation. Uh, Jeff, I think, was really quite good about it. Uh, he burrowed into the book and was able to pull things out of it without um, challenging, you know, the script, which, of course, is a, is a, is a, is a fraction of the uh, book. The, um, this was a long time coming, to put it mildly. Ehud, could you tell us how many, how many versions of this were there, how, how long it took to actually get this from an idea to make the film on your part to the film that we're looking at now? Uh, the film has a long history. I mean, the book has a long history of um, many good people that tried to uh, um, to have the book into a film. It's uh, from Charlie Chaplin that approached him on the, on the, on the early stages, and from uh, Orson Welles that wanted to, to play Adam, and uh, from Betty Davis that wanted to play what Hannah Lasko played, uh, Schwester, and uh, from uh, Jan Kadar and Academy Award, the winner that wanted to direct it and had done adaptation, from uh, Yaki Yosha that tried to uh, write script, and, and other good people that try and uh, couldn't uh, make it. It was very, very difficult to uh, not just to write the script, but you know, to put everything together uh, because of the subject matter. Uh, I know Yoram for um, since 1982 when I first read his book, um, The Last Year, and that I think it's a masterpiece and it changed all of my entire life. Uh, however, and I've done already a book. Uh, I mean, I produced a film, Himo King of Jerusalem, Himo Melech Yerushalayim. It was in this festival. Was, uh, the premiere was in 21 years ago, exactly. And um, I knew the way that, as Joram says, my soul, uh, like my brother and my soul. And uh, you know, I, I knew what what he passed in the book, and, and I knew what he want. That's that's the most important to know what the author want, in order to trust me to bring the people to make this picture in the right way. So it was a quite a journey, first of all, to release the rights of the film because it was, a, it was in limbo 
to cut the story short, in 2002, I, um, I, I got the right. Uh, uh, but you, you know, you don't want me to, to do it already in 92. But I'm glad that I've done it now, 15 years later, because I'm more mature to, to touch this material. I believe so. Uh, Ren and Shaw, the head of the, uh, the uh, Sam Spiegel in Jerusalem, recommended on uh, Noah Stolman. And um, I decided not to touch any script that had been written before and to start from a scratch. So I approached the Noah, and it took us two years to uh, work on the book. And the, the biggest challenge for me, because I'm not a writer, was to give to Noah, my soul brother here, to give it to him in order to, uh, to get the essence of the, of the book. That was my main challenge, and to make it uh, in a way that people can watch it. Because the book of, I mean, Adam is Yoram, for people that don't know. Every of the Mishikas inside, it's in his genius, in his head of what he writes and what he portrays. But you have to relate to a story and to be focused on the main thing that you would like to show, and the main focus was the relationship between Adam to the dog, dog, to the dog boy. So it's required from Noah, and I, I wish Noah was here to, to tell about the, what he done because he wrote it. It's required for him to get into it and and to eliminate a lot of stuff. It took us like five draft of treatment and and four drafted of script, and we didn't want to. <laughs> We didn't want to make uh, the adaptation to happen in Israel because of, of reason of budget uh, to make this film. So we set up the institute in, uh, in Palm Springs in the desert. So uh, when we, uh, and it took us quite a while. When we got the, the, the uh, script that we really loved and liked and were sure about it, we started to send it to several directors. And um, everybody, like very good one, like Barry Levinson and and other, we're afraid to touch the subject matter. They're afraid to be ridiculous. But uh, then, you know, I uh, uh, suddenly somebody reminded me, Mishima, uh, that uh, Paul directed, and I approached the Paul, and Paul uh, 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 read the script and um, liked it, and he met with me. And he said, I loved the whole uh, script, but I would like to read the book. When he read the book, he came to me and said, everything is perfect, but we need to bring it back to Israel. So we changed the whole uh, institute from uh, Palm Springs in California to <laughs> back to the desert that uh, we love so much. And that was because of, maybe because of Paul, and he was right, but it's given a huge challenge in the production itself of, uh, of the book. How many people here have seen the film? Okay, this is the it hasn't shown anywhere before. Oh, okay. I would assume some of you might have traveled internationally and seen it. It's only had two public screenings. It's only Toronto and Telluride. It's been shown in Toronto and Telluride in the last month, uh, and that's, uh, that's it so far. So this is the actually the first screening outside North America. Why was it important for you to set it back in Israel instead of Palm Springs? I mean, Palm Springs to us, to us, it sounds it sounds crazy that this would have been. He was right. Yeah, would have been said in Palm Springs, but maybe there's a maybe there's a secret there that I'm not aware of. No, no, it was just from an American point of view, it's just wildly implausible that uh, such an institute uh, would exist at that time. And of course, it's implausible that it even exists here. It's a very interesting story. This film takes place in a psychiatric institute called the Seisling Institute, which is in the Negev Desert in 1961. Now, no such place existed. It's a fiction. Uh, the book is a fiction. It's not based on, on, on any actual history. And, and Yoram said it in the town of Arad. But at the time he wrote the book, all that existed of Arad was a sign he, that he had seen that said, the town of Arad will be built here. <laughs> and he said, well, what a wonderful place to put my hypothetical hospital in this hypothetical city. So he actually put the, he built the first building in Iran, <laughs> this institute. And, uh, and then uh, we came out and uh, built it for real uh, uh, over a year ago. 
I want to say uh, something, David, uh, and this is very funny, but, but you know, uh, when Al told me that, that it would be shot in uh, America, it was very surprising to me, but I, I said, okay, make a movie, I don't care, make it in Greenland. You know? <laughs> but the Institute, to me, is Israel. Israel is a place where all these main people came. I was here in Haifa. I was working on a ship bringing uh, uh, Jewish uh, refugees from the Holocaust. And uh, we brought the ship here to Haifa maybe eight, nine times. And they all seemed to be uh, part of this uh, hospital. All Israel is about healing the Jews from, you know, and so how can it be anywhere else? I mean, this is all Israel, a bit crazy. People are mad here. People are, you know, very violent and very screaming at each other. I, I was in a taxi before and he wanted to find out where to go. And he, 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 so he started, do you tell me what you get up? And I said, please, but no, no, you should, you know, you should listen. I you know, taxi. And uh, so in a way, this hospital is Israel, and Adam is us. And when they wrote the screen, and when they started to work with the, with the Paul, the only thing I was thinking about, and I asked him about two sentences that I cared about. One was the sentence that Adam says that uh, the, the wise and the good Jews went to America, and the mad one came to Israel. But then I would say, no, it's not there. And the other one is that I, Adam says to, to Jenny, I never hit anyone I don't love. And it does, it is in the movie, and I haven't seen one person who really was impressed by that. I mean, it's not. Uh, but that's the only thing that I really think, said about, thought about until I saw what Paul did. And, uh, you know, it's a great excitement for me to see my own soul. I wrote the book from 50 years ago to 40 years ago, published in 1968. I was not the same person as today. I looked much better. I was, uh, <laughs> I was young. I was wild. Now I'm old and higher. But it's still me, in a way. David, I wanted, yeah, I wanted to ask. You can just respond to that if you want, but also to be more specific about what it was in this book that you are wrote 50 to 40 years ago that scared off lesser souls, that scared off the other direction. Okay. I, I will answer, but just a quick note for the desert. I'm, I'm sorry to shoot it in Israel or not. What scared us, you know, as Israeli, uh, Israeli that um, uh, done it, I mean, the, the scope of the film uh, require to raise a lot of money in order to make it. And it was very difficult to shoot it in Hebrew because then nobody would put us uh, put or invest a huge amount of money that this film needed because it's a it's a, it's a bigger budget film. Uh, so the idea was that you know if you shoot it there, you don't have to have any excuses why you know uh, they talk um, English because it's very it's obvious. So I was scared, no, I was scared, that's the first way, not for financially, you know, how the audience in Israel, I was personally, you know, accepted Israeli actor, you know, talking in, in English, because they don't like it so much here in Israel. But because of the scope of, the, of, the, of, of, of that film, you know, it, it's a moot point anymore, because uh, we have German actor, we have, uh, you know, American actor, we have Israeli actor, so it's, um, it, it doesn't matter at all. So, what was the question? <laughs> what was it? What was it about the book that had scared off the other directors before you approached Paul with the project? You see, people like convention stuff. It's easier for them to deal with it. It's a huge challenge to write, but it's it's bigger challenge to direct. It's it's a, it's a huge challenge because you need to choose the right actor and you need to direct them in a way that the, the people will believe the story. The main thing was for uh, Barry Levinson, uh, is that to me, I'm afraid that the, it's gonna look ridiculous, you know, we're gonna look ridiculous, the, the boy dog relationship with Adam. He was afraid that it, the people will not believe in it, that it's gonna look more grotesque. And I tell you something here that I didn't tell it before, 
Sidney Lovett, uh, read the script and really loved it. So he called me and said, Mr. Driver, I love the script, <laughs> but I have to ask you one question. Is this boy dog is a, in the book, or do you invent it in a script? I said, I've got it. I said, no, this is in the book. I said, okay, and then I will come back to you. He came to me 48 hours after and say, I don't think that I can do it. I said, you can do it, you know, you're Oscar winner and all of these things. He said, yeah, I know. He, he was afraid of the chant. They were afraid of the main, I mean, they were fascinated by the script, but they're afraid of the challenge of, uh, of, of dealing with that uh, uh, boy-dog uh, relationship and not to deal with something conventional. You see, most of the, and, and it's one of the next most of the film, as, uh, as Paul said here about the Holocaust, were based on a true story, based on the pianist, or anything else was based on a real story. Here it's a fiction. So they, they didn't know how to, to, to deal with it, you know, they didn't know how to deal with it. But, you know, it's based on the fiction, but it talked about what happened to the soul. Can you resurrect the soul? Yeah, yeah you see, uh, go ahead. I think, Gordon, did you want to say something? Uh, just quickly, I, I, you know, when I, I remember that when I saw, after uh, Paul was assigned to do it, and to do it, I saw a Mishima. And uh, I said to my wife and to El, that, that only a person who did Mishima could do this movie because Mishima is taking a writer I love very much. Nizari is not so known, but I love him very much. I mean, love him. He's a terrible man, but he, he's a great writer. <laughs> and he made him into, into like, uh, I don't know how to call it, a crossword between hell and, and picnic. I don't know. There was all these beautiful things in it, and yet it was about a guy that wants to to revive the, the, the world's time and, you know, and and so in a way that's it about Adam. I mean uh, I don't know what's frightening about Adam and this is a love story. It is a love story with an old broken down man and a child who will become a dog and Paul said it beautifully. It's a man who, who was a dog and, and a dog who was a child. I mean and, uh, that's really a love story. They love each other and they like each other. Uh, just a, the crossroads between hell and a picnic, if you'd only had it on the mission of poster. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the way Paul has a new print right now, a new, uh, of, of, of Mishima that I've seen last uh, week, uh, 10 days ago, it's amazing, uh, amazing. I, I just wanted to add something else to the, the difficulty of this book, and, and this book has had a hard time, as Europe will tell you, it, it was not well received in, in this country and, and really didn't get its legs uh, in Israel. It got its legs after it was translated and, and started getting the claim in Europe and, and America. And uh, part of the reason for this is that uh, it was written at a time similar books were written, such as Catch-22 and Tin Drum and uh, Slaughterhouse-Five. And these books looked back at the war in a very kind of imaginative, often bitter uh, perspective, uh, hallucinatory in a way. And uh, Yoram's book did the same thing, only he looked back at the, the camps and the Holocaust with this kind of, of literary perspective. Well, you're talking, you're walking pretty sacred ground here in Israel, when you start looking back at the Holocaust with that kind of um, humor and that kind of sardonic, non-reverential tone. And uh, so, in addition to the problem of, of the boy dog and the problem that it was all a fiction, you also have the problem that people, uh, uh, creative people were really scared, of, and I think readers were really scared by the non-reverential tone. Virtually everything you've ever seen about the Holocaust is reverential. You know, we should be, it's like church, we should be quiet, we should be respectful, we should, you know, pay homage to those who, the six million of them died. Well, Yoram's book is full of life and nasty humor and, 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 and looking at, uh, at, at these events from uh, a twisted mirror, and that uh, 
is, is unsettling. Uh, I mean, you know, correct me, I, I am not the one who wrote the book, and I'm not the one who lived here at that time, but it just seems to me pretty obvious that it was unsettling. Yeah, besides the fact that it was, a, a, you know, at the time, Holocaust was looked at a, as, a, as a sacred, you know, and you had to be quiet, and it was not. It was a very human event. Uh, it was 1968, the year after the Sixth Day War. At the time, the news in Israel, at the end of the news, there was the weather report. And it started in Tel Aviv, ended up in South Egypt, or in Yemen, and you know, it went on and on, we had an empire. And everyone felt, you know, now we have Sinai, and we have the West Bank, and soon we're going to have Iraq and Iran, I don't know what. And then come a book, it tells you about broken people living in the desert, making fun of themselves, and it, it, it didn't make, it, it, it didn't, until today, I think the Israelis are not yet keen to that. But when certain songs like read it, and, and uh, I like many others, but when she read it and she said it was a great book, it's because she loved it. I mean, she, she was a Jew, so it was not that she's not Jewish, and, 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 and she's American, and she said, first of all, but, but she loved it because she read it in one night in, in the American colony here in Jerusalem. And she came out and I said, you couldn't read it in one night. So she recited parts of it. And I think that because of that, and because the Israeli critics at the time, maybe now the change I can't say because the young critics today are different, they can see only good things in movies or books that they've seen before, like they've seen before. They can't decipher something that is not yet been done, and no one ever written a term paper about it, no one written a doctor this is about it. And, and so it, 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 it paid me because I worked 10 years and I loved the book, I loved the title, I loved the book anymore, but I mean I, 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 I worked with great, I mean I, I was almost, you, know, you can't imagine the time of our Einstein book, I was drinking heavily, I, I was really drunk, and everything in the book that I, you know, described sickness, I was a sickness. And, and then the book came out, and one write, how can an old, how can a grown-up man write such a terrible book? And I was 38, I said, a grown-up man write such a bad book? It's, it's, it's something that, you know, you, you know, and, and, and then I sit in this place near Tel Aviv, the city, city, it's called Cinema City. There are 52 movie houses there, I don't know what. Or 72, or 100, I don't know. <laughs> and, and we sat in one room, it's a kind of a IVP, VIP. <laughs> VIP, IVP is good too. But, but I was sitting there, and I saw how the book comes to me. How the book comes back to me. I forgot the book. I mean, the, 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 the essence of what, so it was a very great, good, good thing for me. I, I'm sorry about my English. I, I'm, I've been sick now a long time, and, and I forgot my English, even though I lived 10 years in America, and I used to speak very good English. Now, I'm, I'm, I don't know, I'm blubbering. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, it just was published in Spain about a year and a half ago. After a long time, it's been published in 25 years, now in Spain. All of a sudden, the Spanish write such a beautiful abuse, and I read them, the translations. And I said to myself, where were you 40 years ago from that? <laughs> when I was young. But what were, what were some of the more, uh, some other specific things that critics said attacking the book when it came out? Well, you, you, you really know how to bring up those bad memories, don't you? <laughs> well, no, I mean, the, films, the film was supposed to exercise all those memories. Now they're, now they're memories of how wrong everybody else was. Right, I mean, you know, to speak about 
klein, from the dung klein, a little bit Adam, in the same way, was unheard of at the time, not only in Israel. I mean, Klein is a human being. He's cool, but, but he's a human being. He, in, yeah, I don't know. I don't remember now the, the review because uh, it was so long. I know the all of it, but this was just one of them. Right. I mean, the, re the reason I brought that up was to give, to give a sense of how different the times are, and also to, uh, you know, this, this happens to a lot of books. This happens to a lot of books. A lot of them, it happens to before the decision is to publish them. So things you know, have trouble seeing the light of day. Uh, take some, something like Mouse was turned down by 12 publishers, including the publisher who eventually published it. So, you know. 32 publishers uh, rejected the uh, Lolita. I just want to add one thing to the books of, of Jerome. And that's why I am so attached and attracted to whatever he writes. Yoram is not like a prophet, but he, as he said here, he writes things that nobody ever wrote before in the same way, in the same style. And he sees things different. So he, it's a lot of revolution. Now, once, you know, when the Himo King of Jerusalem was out 21 years ago, and we had a very bad uh, uh, review on the, on, the, on the film, and the critics said, you know, it would be in a... Um, Time will judge it, what people will remember. So well, time really judge it, and nobody remembers these critics anymore, but uh, uh, everybody remembered the book, and it's still very valid. The books of your own, and I believe that the film as well, it's like, it's a piece of art. It's like something that will stay for 200, 300, 400 years. The, the thing that you write right now, it's an it's a, it's a, it's amazing thing that no other writer can achieve in a way of being like 40 years ahead of people. Only now people praise the book in Israel right now. Now it's about a rival, but this time not. It's true that in the last, I believe, seven years or eight years, when it was published in Italy and other places, the book got great review and people like it. It didn't get yet the commercial success, it's something completely different, but this book will stay forever, much more than everyone that wrote about the critics about the book, and that it doesn't matter. I know that you are bitter or that now, forget about it. Okay, the book is better. Let, let's move but just back to the general idea of adaptation. There's a conventional wisdom out there that you've, I'm sure you've heard, Paul, and maybe you, Yoram, and they could have heard, that the, the simpler the book, the lower quality of the book, the easier the adaptation. Hence, lots of mystery story, mystery novels, uh, pulp novels, that became classic films because it wasn't such a, a such a literary challenge to to, uh, to 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 succeed in the adaptation. You've heard that. What do you think? Of that? Well, it's absolutely true. Uh, because a simpler book is being defined usually by its narrative, its story. A complex book is often being defined by its language. So it's much easier to adapt a good story. To adapt um, Philip Marlowe, uh, 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 River Channel. You know, th that's like the perfect guy to adapt. It, it's, it's sort of well written, but it's not great writing, but it has a great storyline and a great character, and that adapts very easy. Uh, a, a richly complex book, uh, as I mentioned before, like anything by Faulkner, really hard to adapt. Hemingway, much easier, because the language is much simpler and the storyline is much simpler. So th that's just basic. Uh, uh, screen adapting one-on-one to, uh, to, you know, that is, you know, that's become a cliche because it's true. Um, David, I'm, I'm putting you out of work, but when we, um, my mother used to say to talk, he knows. Um, <laughs> I feel about the books, uh, like these two guys you meet in the street and one says to another, you know, last night I couldn't sleep all night. I was dreaming. I mean, Haifa, Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv, Haifa, all night long, and I got so tired and I had a headache and my, my pain, and Haifa, Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv, Haifa all the time. So his friend says, look, I had a wonderful dream. We were having a party and there were all these beautiful girls and we were drinking. And so the first one says, why didn't you call me? He said, how could I call you? He went, Haifa, Tel Aviv. <laughs> and so I, I feel about my book is that it was a post for any side and I don't know, I, 
One day I'll hand you the book again. <laughs> I think I will. But really what Paul did, believe me, I, I, I don't care what people will say. I care, but this is not so important. But to see some of the scenes in this film is something that you can get a present bigger than that. And, and I have, uh, yeah. I don't, I don't know how much time we have, but you've all been sitting here attentively, and we've had some interesting observations from the audience. Is there anybody else who has a question for anybody on the panel? Yes, please. Did everyone hear that question? No. Um, I hope I'm paraphrasing this correctly. The question you said he once heard Paul Schrader say in an interview, he couldn't tell the difference between the pain in his personal life and the pain in what he wrote uh, when he was writing Taxi Driver. Was it 1974, 75? 72. 72. Um, and the questioner says, is it still the same? Well, in some ways, I got involved in uh, creative writing for the same way you all did as a form of self-therapy. That is, you have to sort of exercise these things. And, and that character, Travis Bickle, was one that I was afraid of becoming. And, and the way I dealt with my fear was to turn him into a, a, a fiction. And unfortunately, it worked. And, 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 and every time you do it again, it works again. And, uh, and you grow out of that. I mean, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you could live a, a whole life uh, in that kind of, uh, of, of pain. Your, your, your body certainly couldn't stand, uh, you know, that kind of uh, wear and tear. So you, hopefully these, these, these passages in, in, one, in one's life are, are relatively short. And, and, uh, and occasionally, though, Sorry about that. you know, uh, the uh, Faulkner once said uh, he, he wrote in Sound of the Fury, he was a night watchman in, in a foundry next to a huge press. And he wrote it, listened to that press go all night long. And he said, many was a day later in my life, I wish I could have bought that press and put it in my office. <laughs> well, the same thing is says, sort of true about the pain you go through as a young man. You know, you're very happy that you're married and you're kind of successful and, you, and uh, your life is sort of good. But occasionally you say, me, I would love to sort of have that pain, you know, just for like maybe two months so I can write a, a script. But it doesn't work that way. And we know when that pain comes back, it doesn't go away either. Um, I just want to say one quick thing before everyone uh, leaves. Those of you who see the film tonight, if you are eagle-eyed, you will see Yoram in the film. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of a little joke. Uh, there is a, a shot where Idan Alterman is talking to Adam. Jeff, and he's pointing to the head of the sanitarium, Dr. Gross, and he says, uh, uh, he says, you know, you think you are, are, yeah, you are in control, but there's a man behind the curtain pulling your strings, and he points at Derek Jacoby, uh, who's standing in his office, and the camera goes over and looks at what he's pointing at. Well, Yoram happened to be on the set that day. So I put Yoram in a suit, which he objected to, and, uh, <laughs> and, and I had him talking to Jarek. So it's a kind of inside joke, because the, uh, the man who's pulling Adam's strings is, in the movie, Derek Jacoby, but in reality, is Yoram Kanuk, the author. <laughs> speak, speak of, speaking of that pain, is the pain doing an adaptation, because it's not a... You know, it's not an absolutely original thing pouring out of you. Any diminished, or do you, have, or, or are there ways to feel just as painful when you're when you're scripting an adaptation? No, it's not. It's not as painful. I mean, one of the tricks of, of doing a good adaptation is you have to find that it, it, it's a it's a trade-off between two things: justice to the book and justice to what you are good at as a writer. There are many ways to adapt a book, and sometimes. You decide, I'm going to just step away from this. I'm not going to put myself into it. The book is really solid. I'm just going to adapt what so-and-so wrote. 
And sometimes you say, I think it's much more interesting if I reach inside the book and find my own pain and write my own pain out and, uh, and make it a kind of collaboration between the original author and me. And that's a, a book by book kind of call. So, uh, you know, it became clearest to me in, in Last Temptation, which was a, a, a 600 page novel, which ended up as a 100 page script, full of different themes. And uh, I broke the script down and I came up with five different scripts I could have written. And one of the five meant more to me than the other five, and that one I wrote. And everything else that wasn't in the one that meant to, that much to me, I just took and knocked off the tape, just knocked it off. And so a, a lot of uh, Kazanzaka's fans are, you know, were sort of upset, well, where were all those elements? And I said, you know, they're not in there because that wasn't, this is the Paul Schrader adaption of this book. It's not the Kazanzaka's adaption. So you've got to make that call sometimes, and the bigger the book, and the more complex the book, the more necessary it is that you make that call. You are, my I, I, I should have asked this before, did you ever try to adapt this yourself? Was there, was there a script by you? Unfortunately, yes. I wrote once a script that was pretty bad. I mean, I'm, I'm not a script writer. And in a way, uh, this is why I don't think uh, writers should interfere with people who make the movie. I never told Paul anything or Edward or Jeff. They just when they ask me something, I answer. But you know, let's say in the book, there is something that is to me very important. But you can't put it in this, uh, uh, you know, but how Schwester discovered God and how this woman went to Kenya and she saw. I mean, there is a whole story that I love very much, but it can't be in this movie. So I, I did look for it. I didn't, I was not uh, crying over loss of, loss of it, but I, I just want to say before uh, Paul described how I, 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 when I was writing the book and I was in a very bad state, I had a friend with the jeep. And we used to go in the desert. This was 1963 or four, which is, uh, you know, the desert was still, I mean, quite wild, there not, no, no roads. And one day we came to some place, we decided to stay overnight. And, and we really saw two Arabs sitting there playing Shishbesh. And there was a sign here, there would be the city of Arab. And I thought, wow, city. Here would be the city of Paris, here the city of Tel Aviv. How can you know a city before it? Uh... So then I, not only did I put the institute near the city, but I put Gross living in the city. So when the city was founded uh, by, uh, uh, by Gashohan, he invited me to, uh, to uh, an evening. And I came, and he was around, you know, in real life. And, it was so sweet, I, 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 and uh, for me the desert, I mean, Ilana was probably four, she, she spent most of her life in the desert, in a really wild place, and I, once I, a few times I've been there, I'll never forget. It is something about the desert that I, I, I very close to me, I, I feel strong because it's like, if I was religious, I would think that this is where God created the world and stopped in the middle, you know, everything, you know, it's, it's like, like this, and, and it's so wild and beautiful, and now they want to build all kinds of hotels in some of these places, and they go crazy about it, but they, they leave the desert alone. And uh, so I put this, and then I thought, you know, I, I wrote about this, uh, it's not in the movie, but the cook is, is, a, is a gourmet cook from France. There are a lot of gourmet restaurants in Tel Aviv in the early 60s. The, the wildest, the most wonderful restaurant was a Bulgarian restaurant that served the kebab with the salmon. And then I, I, I brought all kinds of menus from, I don't know, he made all kinds of things that no one ever seen in Israel before. You know. So I thought, to put it all together, you know, ah, but there is a scene there where you see the people eating and you see how they enjoy the food. That was important. I mean, not, yeah. Yes, please. Uh, Mr. Paul Schrader, uh, did you converse with any of the previous Holocaust movies? I mean, was there any sort of maybe making something that would be popular like uh, Luciani's or Schindler's or Benini or something more special or surrealistic, not for the many, but for
And later, for your own, you, you call your uh, book fiction, but something amazing happened with this book. It's, uh, it was fiction when you wrote it, but today it's not fiction. Today th there are stories about a uh, boy dog uh, in the Holocaust, or boy animal, or whatever. I mean, everything that you wrote from the imagination, somehow, 50 years later, it seems that it all was there. Before so, Paul said, can I just say uh, one thing? No, no, no. One day when the book came out in Sweden, after half a year or so, it was 76 or 7, I forgot, I was invited to Stockholm. And when I came, you know, Stockholm, the airport in Stockholm is farther away than let's say, Moscow from Tel Aviv. So we went, you know, and drive and drive and drive. And, you know, I thought, you know, he said, you, I'll see a man waiting. So I, I was laughing because it is that when you come from Cyprus, after two days, the whole family came from all over the country. <laughs> so he was alone there. He took me to, to start with the talk, and he said, John, I must tell you a strange thing. There is a woman here who converted to Judaism as a result of reading Adam. And I said, wow. So I wanted to meet him. And her name was Christ, uh, Christ Christensen, which is a very good Jewish name. <laughs> and uh, she was, uh, she had a, a small, not small, a large, uh, she, 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 like Reuters for all the town in Sweden, you know, like, uh, 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 you know, news agency for, and, and so I came to see her, and, and she was very, you know, very, and she said yes, and I am like, now I'm going to the synagogue, and, and, and she was so sweet and so beautiful, that later on, that was 77, so later on, when people used to ask me once in a while, what is the address or the strange thing that ever happened to me was your book? Books, I said, ah, I tell the story. After a while, I said, maybe I invented it, because you know, by that time. <laughs> so one day I was in Ramat Achel, near Jordan, and there was a group of Swedish students, and they asked me, what is the strange thing that ever happened? I, this, I said, look, I'm not sure <laughs> what I said now is true. But when I came there, Chris Christensen, so they all were laughing. I said, why are you laughing? Because so our, our man, who, the, the, the guy who brought us us uh, here, is a son. And he stood there, and he said, yes, this is why I'm Jewish, you know. Just before Paul answers the question, the, uh, just repeat the question in case anyone didn't hear it, is did he consult any other Holocaust films and, and incorporate them, or did they play any role in, uh, in, in his work in uh, directing Adam Resurrect? Well, I, I follow uh, world cinema pretty close, so, you know, I, I've seen virtually everything about the Holocaust in the year it came out. And, uh, you know, I, and I, I double-checked a number of films and, and uh, you know, I found that my memory was pretty accurate, you know. You, you, if you're going to make a film like this, you've got to go back and screen Cuckoo's Nest again, you got to screen Schindler's again, you know. So you, you screen them all again. But it's not so much to learn as to just double check that you remember them right. And so, of course, uh, I did that. So the question right here, please. How would you differentiate between the play, which was put on in Tel Aviv once in a year, and your film? Could you oh, uh, the question was how do you differentiate between the play of this theatrical adaptation that was done in Tel Aviv? And the film was that to Mr. Schrader, to no, Paul Schrader, no, or to anyone? Well, to I'll hand it very quickly to Europe. Um, no. I, 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 they gave me a tape of the play, but they didn't. The tape didn't have subtitles, <laughs> <laughs> so I wasn't really able to be greatly influenced by it. And I never saw it. In, in, uh, I was never in a place where it was actually shown. Uh, Europe, of course, is much more familiar with the play. So. No, I've seen the play. I've seen the play many times, and it's not the same, but I think that uh, both directors, both Paul and Julien Rier, took another way, took another road. I mean, they're all based on the book, but still, I don't think uh, there is similarity between the book, the, the movie and the, the play. There is similarity between the movie and the book, but not so much with the play, because the play is a, it's different. I don't know. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Yes, please. I would like to ask Mr. Schwartz, 
further about the um, sanity in the films that you are probably choosing to direct or to write if we are looking about a classic novel or Mishima that I have seen and read the book. Uh, uh, and uh, in the last film, I mean, is there something in this subject that attracts you or you think is yeah, I'll just repeat that if I could. The issue, the question was about the issue of sanity in Paul Schrader's films. Is there something that attracts you to this subject? Yeah, I mean, uh, in, in retrospect, you start to see the, the common elements and things you've done. Uh, at the time you make your decisions, is primarily just out of interest. Oh, well, that's interesting. I haven't done that before. That That's intriguing. That's worth saying. And then later you go back and say, oh, that's what I saw in it, you know. So th th that's kind of normal. Uh, but, you know, for me what's really interesting about art is um, contradiction. And that's what character is. Uh, I'm not interested in, in works of art that lay themselves out and explain themselves for you. I love works of art that are open-ended and have elements in conflict with each other that demand the viewer or the reader uh, participation to solve the work of art. So that uh, what is character? Character is contradiction. I loved her so much I hit her. That's character. I loved her so much I hit her again. Even more character. That's what we do. And so that when you talk about sanity, you know, sanity and, is, and insanity are one and the same. I'm crazy about you. It's the most common phrase in the world. And it's interesting because it's a contradiction, you know? Because why would you want to have someone attracted to you who is crazy about you? You don't want a crazy person, but you, you take it as a compliment. So even in the most simple things like that, contradiction is what makes uh, experience interesting. And, uh, and sanity is, is probably the greatest contradiction of all. Sanity. Sanity. Yeah. Sanity. yeah. yeah. Uh, because we all think we are safe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think uh, Paul and I are safe, but anyway, uh, I want to say something. Uh, uh, you know, I think that Paul and I share another thing, and that is we're both children of the Bible. I've been reading the Bible for 60 years, and Paul grew up in the Bible. And the Bible has a specific thing that doesn't exist anywhere in ancient literature. That is, the characters are not explained. No one explains why Abraham take his son and swim to the desert and take the other one to, and why Isaac betray, and, and, and everybody in the Bible, and the heroes of the Bible are, are, are just doing the thing and you have to take it. There's no psychology, no, no explanation. Only later on come all kind of smart people who try to explain that in fact, the Bible is only about mysteries. And, and I think that, that madness is a mystery. And, and how people act is a mystery. Not what they say, but how they act. And you cannot explain it. When the writers always try to explain, he thought about this. And in the Bible, there's no one sentence that says, he thought to himself that. I mean, he does it. You do it. Here in the movie, Jeff is doing that. You don't know why, and he does it. I mean, this would make me so happy about it because this is the way the book is written. There no, I, I don't like, you know, my family are not psychologists, they're not uh, psychiatrists, and uh, my father used to say things that had nothing to do with explanation, and, and he used to give me the same present for every year because I finished the eighth grade. And, and I already was almost married by the time he was giving me the same goddamn present for the same, this is for you fit, you, you know. So in a way, uh, there's no explanation. But that's what you're so beautiful about art, because art is a lie. It's a lie about life. It's not about, art is not truth. It's not truth, it's a lie. It's a beautiful lie. It's what should have been, not what happened. That Aristotle is said. So, yeah, well, anyways. So no, no interior monologue, like cinema, like, like, like movies. Well, yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, I mean, no, there are interior monologues, but the, but the narrator is unreliable. 
You know, he's telling you the truth, only he doesn't know that what the truth is. I mean, I discovered that in the taxi driver, the very first script I wrote. Uh, what, what, what to me was sort of beautiful about that, is here's this kid that's explaining it all to you, and about halfway through, you realize, this kid is fucking crazy. <laughs> and, and he doesn't tell you that. You see it with your own eyes, and then you have to start rethinking your involvement in the film, because you've been listening to an unreliable narrator. Uh, an unreliable narrator is, is, is a wonderful literary device, and, 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 uh, and your muse is in as well. Uh, I can add something to it. Uh, if we have another few minutes, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, mean, I don't know what I don't know what time how much time we have. So I, as long as people, uh, ten minutes. Okay, I've been given the signal. T uh, ten minutes. So if you have questions, make them brief. Your would you say something like right now? For that, for that. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, one day beautiful. Women. One day I became an expert on madness after this book. And one day a guy called me up and he said that uh, his name is Zwicka or something, I forgot now. And that uh, he must talk to me. So we met him in Kifreshter and it doesn't exist anymore. And in front of me sat a very nice looking, good looking young man, very earnest, very good. And he tells me how they put him in a mental hospital and how they screwed him up and how the doctors made a terrible mistake. And he convinced me. He really did it. And I was sure that he was right. At the end, after an hour, he said, I have a question for you. I know that you know some people on the television. At the time, there was only one channel. He said, every time I look at the news, and I see Chaim Yavid, and I see that he said, I look at him, then he smiles. So what I want you to do is to influence, use your influence, so they'll give me a little room in, the, in Tamir, and I'll be sitting, the, and then with the television, you can have cookies if you want, but I, I can live without the cookies. And I've just made them happy because people are not happy. But for an hour, we talked, I was so sure that I was talking to a professor of literature. Uh, That's quite a story. Uh, any question, other questions from here? Oh, yes, please. Uh, for a good clapper, relatively unknown. It's uh, did everybody hear the question? Choice of the script. Why did you choose the script? A relatively unknown scriptwriter, according to this questioner, given the well-known people you might have been surrounded by. So. The great things about it, that, it uh, that I we I really decided that this book deserved a totally. Tabula rasa approach after so many years that people tried to make it and didn't make it. And I didn't want to look at any other script. So for me, I thought that if you have a, ta a talented new one that know how to write, what does it matter if he has experience or not? It's about talent, if you can do it. The thing that he's not famous or not mean nothing. There are many actors that that are, you know, an amazing actor, I mean, you know, they have a huge star, and after that, 10 years later, they are not stars, because they don't know how to play, or they, they, are, not, they are not stars anymore that sell tickets, but they still know how to play. So for me, it's either you have this talent or not. And I, will, I wanted to be uh, open to any possibilities that anyone, and, and you're right, people offer me quite a bit, uh, you know, well-known, screenwriter and other that, and I said, no, it needs some new approach, and if I have someone that I can try. But with Noah, when we, we took Noah, Noah agreed to some terms that, you know, very well experienced writer that have union probably would not agree, you know, just to give him the script or not. And we insisted that we want to have it in stage to understand the essence of the book, you know, how to break it and etc. So he agreed for a longer process, and it was easier and better for the book, and he was very talented, and I trusted the, you know, the judgment of Erwin and Shaw from the school. And it, 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 that's, that's why I, I took this, this risk, but you know, when we gave this brief, before I even got to Paul, when we gave it to ICM and to other agencies in, in LA to looking for a director, the script got, you know, high rated from ICM. So I knew that we didn't, we didn't miss it. I mean, and to cut the story short, it really doesn't matter 
what people have done in the past or done in the future. It's matter what you're doing in that particular one. And I, as, as I took so many risks in this project, that was one of the risks that I think that I loved. And the best compliment that I added that you have a master, a masterpiece writer and a director near me, but he was known in the beginning as a writer. And he read the script and he said, you know, I hardly want to change anything there. You know, I just bring it back to Israel. So that's the best compliment that you can have. So a question for Paul. To Paul, did, when you wrote Taxi Driver, was that written on commission? Did somebody commission you to write that? Oh, no, no, no. That wasn't. That was written in self-therapy. Uh, that was written in uh, two drafts in ten days. I had been living in my car. I, I had an ulcer, a bleeding ulcer. Uh, and I knew I had to write this script. And, and the metaphor hit me in the hospital of this guy in an iron box floating through the sewer of the city. And, and I was the person inside that box, and I had to, I had to write it. You know. So, uh, and then I, then I left Los Angeles and traveled around the country for six months getting my sanity back. And so uh, I just wrote it to, to, you know, so that I wouldn't become this kid. Was it true that the original title was God's Lonely Man? No, no, no. I, that, that was a quote from Thomas Wolfe that was on the front piece, the, but not the uh, original title. Uh, but I, I wanted to... It'll come back. Oh, um, yeah. Just in terms of a general adaptation, we there was a mistake in the script, and uh, which we didn't catch until too late. We uh, Noah had written, and I had approved, and I had shot an ending, whereby Adam and the phantasm of the commandant meet in the desert and have a confrontation. And it was originally written with the metaphor of Jacob and the angel in mind. And so it was a wrestling match. Cut the whole film together, it didn't work. And it didn't work because uh, how can a corporeal and an incorporeal being physically have contact together? And how can such an idea of the evil that resides inside ourselves and the madness that resides inside ourselves be settled by a physical confrontation such as wrestling. It was just a mistake. We had made a mistake. And uh, fortunately, uh, we were granted the money to go back and reshoot that. And we did it as a, strictly as a dialogue. And, uh, and a dialogue about um, suicide and whether Adam uh, should uh, kill himself to get rid of Klein because Klein Commandant is still living inside him. And, and the Commandant says, the only way you're going to get rid of me is to kill yourself. So then it became a much more cerebral and a much more interesting resolution. But, you, you, know, you know, even though years were spent on this script and, and I went over it and everybody went over it, you still make mistakes. And, uh, and if you're lucky, you get a chance to go back to principle. You're absolutely right. Like there was one small things with your, with the mistake that you raised right now, that uh, in the book, that's what he's doing. So the adaptation went on the book, but the film, but the film we, we couldn't do it. It didn't, didn't work, but it was in the book. So you, you've all been given the this was not because this was God. In the book, he was God. Because for me, the, 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 the commandant was just God, because the Holocaust was done by, the, by God. I mean, it was not, uh, uh, you know, it, the, uh, think of think of all this inside information you have now. Uh, any other questions? Yes, please. I wonder about the theme. I feel a very strong connection between you. Are you intrigued to do another adaptation of uh, your own book? Another? Is there another adaptation be, because of the strong connection between your arm and Paul Schroeder? Well, I mean, your arm and my eye, they're... Uh, I, I'm you know, sort of crazy about your arm doesn't work, but we're both sort of bakers in the in the, in the food line of art, and uh, and uh, we simply you know don't have the the power to sort of mandate and say okay let's do the last two. Uh, we need can, somebody to actually. Can you recommend? I might be asking for something. Then you're ten years in the Oregon. Oh, I do. Which one? I don't know how it's going to Oh, well, yeah, yeah. I read a manuscript, which is a, a kind of a journal of, yes. of, uh, of uh, York's days in New York. But that's never been published, right? Uh, not, not in America. 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 Not in America.
You, you, you have to set our website and self publish it. What module is it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, oh. um, speaking of inside information, well, no, I, I won't tell you this because of the story. Can't, you can't not. You can't bring it up and not tell us. <laughs> well, the story really makes sense if you've seen the movie. We had one scene in the film. We only had to cut out one scene in the film, and it will be on the DVD. It was a scene that was probably most representative of the book, and uh, we agonized over it. I loved the scene, and but it was just too confusing because uh, this speaks to the, the challenge of doing such a complex book. In the book, after the war is over. Adam keeps his commandant alive and turns him into a scholar of Semitic languages, keeps him in an attic, gives him a, 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 penny, a penny a week, which he gives him in a condom, and makes him, with his kippah on, study Hebrew and Semitic languages. This is in the book, and, it was, and Jeff and Will did the scene, and it was a really kind of terrific scene but it was so bizarre <laughs> and so out of left field that when we started screening the film, and it occurred at a critical point about an hour and a half in, and people just went, huh, huh, what a, and, and we couldn't get them back. And, um, and uh, we had talked about this scene in pre-production. We said, you know, this is risky, this one may not work. And I said, I love this scene so much, you know, let's do it, let's just do it. But uh, it, it was too surreal. It was too surreal. You have to send other drunk copies. No, the, 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 it'll be on the uh, DVD. Okay. So now, now, now that Paul Schrader has created at least 100 consumers of the DVD, even before the film is shown in Israel, it's a very good marketing maneuver, I have to say. So anyway, thanks, Paul Schrader. <laughs>